All right, so with Mars models, we have two primary hyperparameters that we need to consider. One is, what is the number of terms retained in the model? So in the previous models, we kind of let Mars just kind of run off and do its own thing um, on its own. And that typically does pretty well. We get decent results. But we are in control of the number of terms retained in our Mars model. So we want to be able to tune this. The other hyperparameter is the maximum degree of interaction allowed. Okay, so do we want to have no interactions? Do we want to allow two degree interactions, three degree interactions? Now, rarely there's there's not much benefit that we'll see in assessing uh, interactions greater than third degree. So honestly, when I assess this, I typically look at interaction either no interactions or only second degree interactions. Okay, so when we tune Mars models, we already saw how Mars models can take some time when we train them, especially when we train looking at interactions. So Mars models can become computationally intense. This means they don't scale all that well. Well, we can start, or to kind of address this issue, when we are gonna do our grid search or assess our hyperparameter values, we probably wanna be a little bit more smart with how we assess them. So a good practice is start with 10 evenly spaced values for the maximum terms um, allowed in our, uh, allowed in our, uh, our model. So here, let's go ahead and take a look at this code. Here I'm creating my Mars model object, and I've got num terms, that's the number of terms, that's a hyperparameter I wanna tune, and the degrees of interaction, prod degree, that's what that is. And so these are the two I wanna tune. So again, I add tune for my placeholders, because those are the hyperparameters I wanna tune. Now I create um, a five-fold cross-validation procedure. And then I create my recipe. I'm not doing any feature engineering. I'm simply creating my formula here that I'm gonna pass. And then I'm gonna create my grid. Okay, so let's, I'm gonna go ahead and I can run this grid. And what I can do is, let me bring the screen over here so you can kind of see the output. And so here I'm going to assess number of terms that range between 10 and 50. So I'm gonna retain number of terms, total of 10 to 50 terms, and then I'm gonna allow for one and two degree um, interactions. This pro degree, the default is to assess one and two degrees. And then I'm gonna assess 10 values um, of my number of terms. All right, so here is my data form. I have 20 total um, hyperparameter combinations, you can see the number of terms range from 10 up to 50. And then the degrees of interaction, I have one, and then I have two, okay? So those are the hyperparameter values I'm gonna assess, a total of 20 different combination of hyperparameter values. All right, so with that, then the next thing is I just use tune grid, I pass my Mars model that I created up here. I pass my model recipe, I pass my five-fold cross-validation object, and I pass my hyperparameter grid that I wanna assess. All right, let's go ahead. I'm gonna run this, and then at the end, I, I just do show best. This is gonna show the top five best-performing models. All right, so my model is done. If you ran this on your own, you would have noticed it took a little while until it completed. Um, but here, we've got our top five best models. And the first thing you should notice is we've seen a, pr a drastic reduction in our cross-validated RMSE. So far, when we have been applying linear regression and regularized regression, we've been seeing results in the uh, anywhere from the 40 to 30,000 range for our cross-validated RMSE. Now with the Mars model, by allowing um, these this nonlinear effect, we're seeing a much better, um, a much uh, stronger improvement in our cross-validated RMSE. We're down to uh, 26,678. All right, so this best model 
is actually created by, well, one, we see that all the top five models are using um, second degree interaction. So apparently allowing interaction effects is, uh, is a good thing. We're seeing good improvement. And we see that the number of terms used is pretty much ranging from about 32 up to 50. So it seems to be a kind of a sweet spot for the number of terms, somewhere in that mid thirties um, to upper 40 range. Now we can go ahead and use that auto plot to visualize our performance. Now I apologize, this kind of output uh, a little bit larger than I expected here, but we can kind of see that what we are showing here is along the bottom is the number of terms allowed. Okay, so we can see if we focus on this top one, this is RMSE, we see this decrease in our RMSE as we add more terms and then kind of flat lines up here in that mid 30s to 50 range, right? So by adding more terms, this is a good thing and this seems to be kind of the lowest. And then we can see the degree of interaction is the color, right? These different lines by color. We have this top one, which I believe is red. I'm colorblind, so um, I hope that is red. We see that no interactions, but then we see across the board by allowing these um, second degree interactions, we consistently see a lower RMSE across all the number of terms um, compared to no interaction. So that's a good thing. All right, so we can definitely kind of see the sweet spot right in here of where a uh, about 36 to 40 terms in our model and allowing for secondary interactions is having drastic improvement in our model performance. Now, if we go ahead and scroll down, we can see this is the same procedure that we saw in the previous lesson. Here, I'm going to go ahead and select the best hyperparameter values um, from my, uh, my grid search. And then I'm gonna go ahead and finalize my workflow. Here I create that workflow object, I add my Mars model, my formula, and then I go ahead and finalize my workflow with the best hyperparameters. And then I can follow that up with training this across all the training data. And then I'm gonna fit the top 20, or excuse me, I'm going to extract the top 20 most influential variables. And when I do that, we can see that ground live area is the most influential, followed by the year built, total basement square footage, uh, if a home is rated overall um, excellent. Uh, here's another one, if it's rated overall very excellent, and so on. All right, so we can see which features are most influential in our model. Now here's the thing, we are actually um, creating a relationship that is non-linear, right? Mars models allows us to capture the non-linear relationships between our features and our, um, our response variable. So it becomes helpful to actually visualize this relationship because with linear models, we had that coefficient that just said, here is that relationship, but it was a constant slope, okay? Where here, what we wanna do is take a look at what is this, re this non-linear relationship? And we can do that with what, um, what's called partial dependence plots, or we call these PDPs for short, a PDP plot. PDP plot, um, let me go ahead and run this. It's gonna take just a little bit to, um, to produce, uh, but what a PDP plot is doing is it's going to plot the change in the average predicted value or predicted response value um, based off of the value of, of X. So here, what I did here was I took ground live area. This is the most influential or most important feature in our model. So I wanna understand what is the relationship between this feature and our response variable. I can do that with this code here. It might be worth you just kind of playing around with this code to see what's going on. Um, but what, what I get in return is I get across the values of ground live area, as we see an increase in the total square footage of a home, what is the relationship with the predicted value 
of our home. So we can definitely see that we have this kind of linear relationship here. And actually, if you look closely, there's a small knot right here. So we get a slightly steeper increase. But then once we get homes that are, let's say, over 3,000, we see this huge increase in our um, relationship with our predicted values. So it looks like as homes get larger, we see kind of a certain points where there's an even larger increase in that relationship between the square footage and the predicted value of the home.